I did my doctoral dissertation in 99 on the epistemology and ontology of Michael Oakeshott. And he is one of the great, albeit later, expressions of the sort of neo-Hegelian British idealist movement. And I think there's a lot of similarities between Junon and, and Oakeshott, especially given the situation. My dissertation was on the relationship between nominal modern science and the force and violence that has to be used to impose that on a society. In other words, modern nominalism is at the root of tyranny in the modern world. So, science. Junon, it is always relative. It is never fundamental. Science can talk about secondary issues and questions. It is incapable, in and of itself, of dealing with primary cases and situations. That is logic that is axiomatic, not the sort of experimental nominalist concept. The science is secondary in that it is parasitic on other sorts of knowledge, logical, metaphysical. Science is a problem because it deals only with appearances. The nominalist mind can only see appearances. It can only look at a human being and see that he has long hair or is male or is wearing sneakers. That's all the nominalist can see. There is no human nature manifest in this person. It is almost a random and arbitrary set of qualities, uh, height, weight, color, hair, etc. But that's all science deals with. Science can only talk about cause and effect amongst the qualities of objects that we are faced with, strictly appearances. Therefore, science is very superficial. It has its uses, of course, but it is very superficial, literally, because it only deals with appearances. Positivism is somewhat of a close cousin to nominalism, and Junon sees it as absolutely absurd. And he sees it as absurd for this reason, one that I share very much, because the claim of the positivist movement which is really, I mean, positivism is modern science in terms of its method. It claims that knowledge is possible without any ultimate first principles or ends of humanity. The minute you start saying that the scientific agenda within a bureaucratic scientific establishment has a certain set of ends. You, know, you want to cure disease, and it's good to cure disease because it's good that more people rather than fewer not be killed by this disease. That is an extra scientific end. All scientific questions ultimately have a moral ground, that it's good for us to know X rather than Y. That means that all scientific methods have to have these universal ends based on the essences of objects, the realist existence of actual universal things that exist in Logos, in God's mind. Ultimately, the problem with positivism and science is that people in the modern world do not care about the truth of the matter. Most of the time, they flee from understanding the truth of the matter. No, the modern scientific establishment is based solely on technology, on the application of their knowledge, which allegedly will make our lives much easier. That may or may not be based on the truth of the relations amongst objects in the natural world. The fact is that facts, the way we use the word facts, these only have meaning within a broader theory. They do not exist separate from your basic approach to the world. And that basic approach is not scientific, because scientific methods themselves presuppose a logical set of concepts. The logic that we human beings adduce to things, which makes science something trustworthy. But those axioms, those first principles, are not scientific, and science cannot make them. Never uh, confuse science proper with the present bureaucratic scientific establishment. Those are two very separate things. And when I have debated many of these you know, positivist types, they refuse to make that distinction. The modern scientific establishment is science with a capital S, which of course is nonsense. Ultimately, Janon's idea is one that I share very much. Truth does not exist. It doesn't exist in the nominalist world. The nominalist world only sees the elite's ability to manipulate nature, including human nature, 
to get nature to do something that she normally would not do. You're forcing nature to do something, and that is the nature of technics. That is the nature of science. The old alchemical concept was, according to Junon, a concept of cosmic order. The real relations among things, even apart from their material manifestations. Modern chemistry, on the other hand, is really just about the materialism, profits, satisfying a certain overarching agenda, both intellectually and uh, in terms of state, corporate America, whatever it is. Confusing science with the scientific establishment is a tremendous error. It's sort of like confusing ethical behavior with the Department of Philosophy at the University of North Dakota or the philosophic establishment in universities in general. Those are two different things. Okay, the second concept is rationalism. And most of you know Michael Oakeshott's most famous work is a, an elongated essay called Rationalism and Politics. Now, Oakeshott is approaching this from a neo-Hegelian point of view, which I don't want to get into now. I guess you could order my dissertation. It's online somewhere. The concept is the rationalism fits together as the epistemology of positivism and nominalism. Rationalism is mechanism, the idea of reducing human beings and nature to a machine rather than an organism. The Enlightenment is based, on, especially the, the early French Enlightenment, is based on the concept that nature is a machine. While, of course, the reaction to the old medieval concept was that nature is an organism. Two very different things. There's a difference between an or organism and an organization. It's kind of like saying the U.S. Constitution contains a certain words and phrases that we may find agreeable. But the constitutional order itself is not written down on paper. It manifests the life of Americans at a certain place and time. There's a huge difference between the concept, the organism of things, and how they are manifest externally in terms of mechanized life. Rationalism rejects anything that is super-individual. The problem with nominalism is that it's about modern power. If there are no intrinsic meanings in the natural order, including human nature, they claim that there are no intrinsic meanings. There is no intrinsic connections amongst natural objects, except that human beings give them this conception. That means the scientific establishment now has given itself the power to interpret all natural function and all natural ends. If there are no intrinsic relations among natural objects, what that means is then the scientific establishment can create those meanings and those relationships and those ends. And of course they're going to do so from their own point of view and in their own interest. Unity in the rationalist and nominalist mind is impossible because the unity is part of the sort of supersensible relation among objects. But the super-individual is something that objectively exists. The unity of human traditions, the Jungian archetypes, for example, symbols which are in common civilizations that probably had no contact with one another. It's one of Junon's major arguments is that natural law functions the same in all human societies. They have the same needs, the same desires. They're almost all based on the family and virtues that come with the family. In other words, the proof of natural law and the proof of, of, of realism against nominalism is that societies around the globe, not only in space but also in time, going back to the earliest records of mankind, have the family as the basic unit, usually the extended family. From that, there's deduced a whole bunch of virtues, you know, loyalty and solidarity and the headship of the man. Uh, as the main protector of the family, etc. These exist in every society that has ever existed. There is no society that ever rewarded cowardice as somehow a virtue, or ignorance, stupidity as somehow a virtue. These are things that are built into the very nature of the cosmos and of human relations, and we partake of that cosmos within logos, within the idea of the unity of created things as an immaterial 
formal quality, one that exists inherently, not one that is placed there by the scientific establishment. Nominalism is false because it can't make any sense out of the commonalities of universal metaphysical systems, of universal virtues which are protected in every society on the globe. Adultery is punished on every society that has ever existed. Adultery is considered a bad thing. Family is considered a good thing. Only in late modernity, the absolute domination of the scientific establishment and technical control, only then do you see these natural institutions begin to fall apart. And in fact, the very denial that they're natural institutions in the first place. Nominalism uh, hides behind the scientific bureaucracy, but it cannot make sense out of all of the formal connections amongst different peoples uh, throughout the world, thousands of cultures that never had any contact one with another, and yet they all have a concept of God, they all have a concept of uh, family, and hence things like adultery and, and faithfulness. They all have some kind of a military force, and they reward valor and bravery. Uh, they're all the same in that particular regard. Now, how these things are manifest day to day, uh, that, of course, is going to change, and that's the basis of a nation, ethnic group. It's the same formal qualities, just they're organized a bit different, different language and different set of uh, uh, stresses and different sets of emphasis. But that's the proof that nominalism is false. The fact that the family, the tribe, the ethnic group, these are uh, usually with a religious grounding, a cultic grounding, are the ultimate foundations of societies around the globe until the modern era proves that these things are super sensible and super individual. The fact is, and this is Janon's brilliance, is the concept that truth does not exist in the nominal and positivistic world. Truth is truth because the scientific establishment or the state says it's true. And it's true because it's useful. And it's useful for one group of people over another. If you want to reduce truth to the ability to use something, utility, you've now destroyed the concept of truth and substituted in its place the fact that something may work for a certain end. Those ends usually are not yours. Those ends usually are in corporate America or the state or the military apparatus or whatever. And the big question here is the battle against nominalism. I mean, I'm trained in, in metaphysics and in ontology at the doctoral level, but nominalism is something that more or less is enforced at the academic level. Uh, nominalism, positivism, rationalism, essentially the same thing. There's some elements that do not overlap but for our purposes, those three are the same thing. Human societies have a tendency, no matter where they are or what period of time you find them in, develop the identical number of virtues. The family is always the center, often the extended family. The tribe is essentially the most extended family. It usually has a linguistic and a cultic basis. There's always the idea of God. There's always the idea of family, and hence the virtues and vices that revolve around that. Wherever you go, those things are held the highest esteem. Only in late modernity, only in our particular postmodern world, are those things under attack. And they're under attack because, ultimately, of the metaphysical system of nominalism, the idea that there are no intrinsic relations amongst objects or classes of objects in nature. It's all accidental, it's all random, and what the scientific establishment is supposed to do is take these facts about how things work and put them together in a view of the world that serves utility. That which is the most useful and expedient is the most true. And that's the problem. That's the problem all of us who are doing battle with modernity and the modern mind, ultimately we end up on these topics. But as I hinted at before, modern scientific society is an anomaly. There's no other society that has produced anywhere near our level of technology. And it's a real problem, because how long did the Roman Empire exist? And yet they never developed an iPod, or a personal computer, or an internal combustion engine. Only the much later Western civilization, French, German, Dutch, English, whatever, 
came up with these things. Roman Empire may have existed from the Republic all the way to the fall of Constantinople in the 15th century, having remained almost exactly the same in its technology, whether it be pagan or Christian or whatever period of time in the Roman Empire or in the Persian Empire or the Mongol Empire. Technics was not the expression of their mind. Law and justice may have been, however imperfectly, but Janon cannot find evidence of any society, no matter how literate, no matter how large, no matter how rich, that was capable of producing these billions of gadgets and circuits and everything else and have the technology be the very center of how people come to relate to each other, just like we're doing right now over Internet radio. The concept here is that Western civilization, because of the introduction of nominalist philosophy, which of course begs the question, has a scientific establishment that is incredibly wealthy and powerful and defines itself not in the approach or in the pursuit of truth, but in the pursuit of those objects that are useful to humanity. I mean, normally, when we think of just our day-to-day relations to things, we see objects, we use language to identify those objects, and we just assume that because I am an individual, those things that I'm talking about are also essentially individuals. That's the nominalist, modern, positivist, scientific idea. It is false. The truth of the matter is that an individual can only come into existence because it already participates in a form or an essence far larger than itself. St. Augustine, almost all the Church Fathers, and René Junon say that truth must, by its very structure, be super-individual. It cannot be an individual thing. It has to stand over individual things. If it does not, then it's only the creation of the human mind. If it's just the creation of the human mind, you have no way of knowing one way or the other whether it's true or false. It has to conform itself to a transcendent cause. That transcendence becomes imminent when it is clothed in matter, whether it be a plant that is green, whether it is a Christ who took a man's nature, or whatever it is, the Logos finds itself encased in matter. The matter helps to symbolize the form. The form makes the matter what it's supposed to be. This is the nature of truth. It must be above any particular object that we come across. If it is not, then it is the creation of our mind, and of course, in modern times, the creation of the scientific establishment. Reason is a problem. Reason does not posit its own ends, contrary to what Kant may have thought. Reason's purpose is to figure an intelligent and efficient way to reaching ends that can only be understood outside of science. Reason is relative because reason is related exclusively to the ends that we have chosen and those ends, of course, cannot be scientific. Science presumes this logical structure. It uses it, but it is not the same. The logical structure of reality is something that science takes for granted, not that it deals with directly. Nominalism and naturalism are really the same thing. There is no unity. There is no overarching meaning to all of the forces in the cosmos. Utility is substituted for truth. Truth becomes a matter of expediency only. The real problem with positivism and the modern scientific mentality is that the scientific establishment alone has taken to itself not only the concept of what is true or false, but also what is real and what is not. Utility becomes the ultimate end. And usually the scientific establishment has to get their money from somewhere, the state, corporate America, university. It's often in their ends and in their interests that the scientific establishment chooses its ends and its purposes. Science is like reason. It's a tool and only a tool. It does not posit its own ends. The system, the regime, as I have used the word consistently on this show and in my writings, this tightly integrated set of institutions, religious, economic, uh, state, media, entertainment, all of these forming a general unity to bring about the New World Order and the complete uniformity of all the peoples and cultures of the world. 
That is the ultimate expression of the New World Order, but that is what gives modern science its ends and its purpose. Consumer electronics, technology, the military technology, and, and everything else, all of this derives from not science, but science being hired to figure out how we can build better engines and better rockets and better chemicals that we could use to kill people with. Nominalism knows one power, and that is money and prestige. This is what makes something true and something false. The whole concept of equality derives from the nominalist idea. In Janon's view of priesthood and royalty, he makes this extremely clear. The whole concept I've dealt with on this show, Michael Hoffman and so many others have dealt with in the past, the central Masonic ritual of the killing of the king is the birth of this kind of scientific nominalism. It's the king, not just as a monarch, but of course as many metaphorical expressions of the king, the priest, the bishop, the head of the family, the general in the army, God as father, all of these are the male king. The killing of the king ritual means that you destroy that source of unity and you substitute the will to power. The great thing about Nietzsche is that he was honest enough to say that he didn't give a damn about truth. Truth was something that the supreme create, sheer force of will. There is no truth in Nietzsche. It is pure chaos. The only hope we have of even approximating it is that the superior impose their will on this social chaos. Ultimately, Junon vehemently rejects that general point of view. You either have the realist world of Logos, where truth is actual correspondence to the origin and ground of all things, or you have a scientific establishment that has its ends posited and placed upon it by their paymasters. The question is, what would science look like today if the state and corporate power, economic power, had not come to control it and fund it? Would the priorities be exactly the same? This shows that reason and science are not ends. They are methods. They're technical approaches. Ends be given by religion, logos, philosophy, the true moral ends of man within this logo system that I've dealt with. And I know this has been fairly abstract, but our purpose is to rip down all of the appearances and get to the root of what makes the system work. At least it's coherent. It may be destructive, but it's coherent. The real major issue, as you know, and most of these sort of medievalist people like me, the main concept is that science has its purpose given to it. The ends of humanity are not a scientific idea, but even more outrageous is the idea that positivist science claims that it and it alone not only says what is true, but also what is real. And if it can't come under positivist nominalist methods in the laboratory, it does not exist. And for Janon, this is the root of the crisis of the modern age, the worship of quantity and the rejection of quality as accidental.